This isn't the first time that Chatham House has put together a team of authors to deal with things that people get wrong about Russia. In May of 2021, there was a report called Myths and Misconceptions in the Debate on Russia, which tackled some of the things that people consistently get wrong when designing policy to counter Russian foreign and domestic initiatives. That dealt with things like the idea that Russia already considers itself at war with the West, the idea that there aren't actually any common grounds between Russia and the West and no common interests. But the war in Ukraine has shown that people get a lot of things wrong too about how Russia goes to war and why Russia goes to war as well. So this follow-up actually looks at things people get wrong about the Russian armed forces and how Russia wants to use them. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, um, a lot of conceptual debate took hold in the West saying, um, how should we understand this new form of Russian warfare? And this became known as either hybrid warfare or grace on warfare. The idea that there is this kind of space between peace and war. It's not really war. It's not really peace. And I, I say that is myth because um, there's nothing about it that is really ambiguous. And there's no problems in responding with legality. A number of analysts, pundits, and even key decision makers have talked about the importance of the Suvalki Gap or Suvalki Corridor. It's not entirely clear why Russian political and military leaders would ever feel the need to close the gap or the corridor. After all, by taking actual NATO territory, that would precipitate an Article 5 crisis, which could lead to escalatory dynamics that they themselves would be unable to control. Moreover, there are no special natural features that would present unique military challenges or opportunities. And indeed, the third reason why I think the Sovalki gap is overstated in its importance is that NATO forces or NATO defense plans more generally can flip the problem on its head, that they can threaten Russian military assets in the region, they can cut off Kaliningrad and hold at risk whatever Russian military forces are in the area. I wrote uh, the myth number three, entitled Russia wouldn't attack a NATO member uh, state. It is not an impossibility, even if the likelihood is debatable and depends on future circumstances. I also argue that uh, Russia's rationale behind all this is not based on cost-benefit calculations. This is ours, not their way of thinking and Russia wants simply power and recognition of status through wars of conquest. My chapter uh, takes on the myth that Russia's use of force is driven by Putin's popularity. I think by focusing on kind of the way a leader feels about their own stability and office is really a misguided approach to understanding how Russia uses its military force. It doesn't give us any analytic purchase on anticipating or understanding when Russia might use military force. My myth is dealing with the, the fact that uh, there's a, a misconception that the Russian A to AD circles or bubbles that, that are often drawn on maps and infographics are some kind of impenetrable steel domes uh, inside which NATO forces or, or forces from other countries can't move and fight without sustaining catastrophic losses. Uh, and my argument there is the fact that uh, due to both doctrinal as well as technical and uh, financial and uh, a number of, of reasons which make these systems less effective than they, they seem to be on paper, uh, in fact, it, it is certainly possible to move and fight within range of Russian long-range weapon systems. The myth is that... Um... As uh, analyzed by some, Russia will not really use nuclear weapons. Uh, this is not a prediction that Russia will use nuclear weapons uh, today, tomorrow, anytime. Instead, it's uh, 
a rather call to wake up, as it were, and to, in fact, make sure that it does not happen. If we consider the nature of the regime that has been built in Russia, it is uh, characterized by one persistent feature. It's a cycle of, uh, first of all, internal repression, which began in the 2010s, uh, now almost inevitably followed by external aggression. In my piece, I talk about a persistent and potentially dangerous myth, which is that Russia is unable to sustain its military expenditure um, due to unfavorable economic conditions. And this is something that we see quite a lot where people assume that because of Russia's relative economic weakness and that their leaders will at some point be forced to reduce military expenditure so that they can focus on more pressing concerns. This is a country that um, really does prioritize military expenditure and it has a military, albeit one that hasn't performed as well as we thought it would in Ukraine, but it has a military and that it's prepared to use and that can cause a great deal of damage. And some leaders, I think, have seen that as an inconvenient fact and therefore have chosen to ignore it. So for them, that, that analytical error that I think a lot of um, media commentators make is quite convenient to lean on uh, for politicians who would rather not wake up to reality and would rather not um, ask their countries to spend more on the military. The misconception is that uh, Russia is focuses basically with the military buildup on improving safety, security of the operations in the Arctic, constabulary operations because the Arctic Ocean is opening up. And, and obviously and understandably, Russia has to strengthen its uh, position in the region to, in, to be able to, to maintain safety and security. So what, one aspect of the misunderstanding is, is the offense-defense uh, element in the Russian military. Uh, the distinction between offense and defense in, in the Russian strategic thinking is not clear-cut. There is also the geographic aspect of the misunderstanding regarding the Russian military activity in the Arctic. And so the Russian Arctic is often uh, incorrectly treated as a one monolithical space. So people talk about Russian military. And if you focus on the eastern and, and central uh, part of uh, the Arctic, uh, it looks very different. It does look more defensive, uh, but the, the western, the European part of the Arctic has a very different picture of the Russian military activity. So I think this differentiation is extremely important. The myth that I am tackling in my piece is that uh, Russia's nuclear strategy can be described as escalate to de-escalate, which is this notion that Russian nuclear strategy is all about basically nuclear coercion, that Russia will seek to coerce an adversary uh, by invading, for example, a NATO country, and then um, using a nuclear weapon against uh, that adversary uh, in the course of conventional military operations in order to try and force the adversary to uh, give up on the uh, objectives that it has. There is a kind of a myth in Western media and foreign left-wing uh, politicians that Russia and China might join forces uh, towards the West by maybe not um, the Euro forming an alliance, but by de facto coordinating their course of diplomacy and by um, at least um, offering limited military assistance in case of conflict with the West. And that myth is wrong. It is essential to make clear that Russia and China do not have an intention and they lack the capabilities to form really an alliance because both sides have a lot of divergent interests and cost-benefit calculations when it comes to the West. And they lack a reliable basis of trust. The thing is, we, we tend to apply Western constructs and Western's frame of understanding to non-Western problems, to very Russian problems. And in a way, the Kremlin and the Russian decision-making are a world of their own. And by trying to copy-paste our own understanding on how the Kremlin would or would not do things in terms of warfare generally doesn't work. So by trying to myth-bust in a way these, uh, these misconceptions, we are trying to bring the debate into a, a, a much more um, realistic and objective uh, sphere.